Summer, the season of blockbuster movies. A period of wonder, magic, and creative inspiration. From original movies like Fast and Furious to the innovative visual effects of The Flash, we dive not so deep into the movies that I saw in summer 2023. It was quite a year for movies this summer. I can't say it was one that was particularly great. If you couldn't tell in the intro, I was being sarcastic. It really was a disappointing year for films, let's be honest, like every year, pretty much. Now, I just want to know, I did not see every film this year. I'm sorry I didn't see Transformers 10, The Rise of the Mega Dinobots. Having said that, I did watch Fast and Furious, so I probably should have watched Transformers as well. But I'm bored of that franchise, I'm not so bored of this one. Also, I'm not going to be going into deep detail about each film, I'm just going to keep it plain and simple, just talk about things on the surface and my general impression of each film. So let's get right into it. And there's only one place to start, and of course, it had to be a Marvel film. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. We were gone for quite a while. But no matter what happens next, the galaxy still needs its guardians. Now, Marvel itself have been going on a kind of downwards projection, and Marvel are now in, I think, phase five, phase four, whatever it is. But since Endgame ended, the movies that have been produced by Marvel have not been particularly well received by audiences and critics. Spider-Man No Way Home, of course, being an exception. And for me, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is probably my favorite of this phase. I know a lot of people are quite mixed about this film, but I felt quite engaged throughout the whole story. And the reason I was on board with these movies is because it's directed and written by James Gunn, who worked on 1 and 2 of Guardians of the Galaxy. The story is pretty much a last hurrah for the gang. The story focuses a lot on Rocket's backstory, and I quite like that aspect of the film. And I really love the dynamic between each of the characters, which has been consistent throughout all three movies. I think all the actors do a great job in this film, particularly Dave Bautista, who plays Drax the Destroyer. I always love his type of comedy in this film. And I love the humour that James Gunn instills in this film. Now because it goes into Rocket's backstory, there are some scenes that are quite cruel towards animals. Now if you've seen this film, you'll know that the backstory of Rocket is quite intense, and that's what I liked about the film, it had a very good emotional beat. Sure, there were moments where I felt like it could have been better. There was one aspect of the story regarding these gold people that didn't really work for me. If I'm being honest with you, The Guardians of the Galaxy is probably my favourite film in the whole of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It certainly has the best humour for me, and it uses it appropriately with the action. And if I'm being honest with you, and this is a hot take I guess, but The Guardians of the Galaxy for me, have a far better chemistry than the Avengers. And I think that works because 1, 2 and 3 have been written by James Gunn, whereas the Avengers have been written by various people. So James Gunn understands the characters in a more intimate way and sees how they've grown together from 1 to 3. I don't think it's nearly as good as Guardians of the Galaxy. It's I wouldn't say that Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is a good film, but it is a lot better than what Marvel have been producing as of late. But to be honest, that bar is really, really low right now. Another thing is that this film is quite unique and odd. I like that kind of thing, but if you don't, this movie is not going to be for you. But overall, I like the film, I would watch it again, and it's definitely one of the best I've seen this summer. Los Angeles, 2001. Humble roots, local kids, street racers who became hijackers. Moving on to Fast and Furious X, the 10th film. How did we get here? Remember when this franchise was about just racing cars? At what point did it go from that to some espionage Mission Impossible heist? Like, they've been to space, what more needs to be said? I don't even know what these films are about anymore. Like, what, what's the actual theme? I'm struggling to understand what... I can't quite put my finger on it. What is it? Look, the reason why I saw Fast X is because I kind of have a guilty pleasure for the franchise. I do not watch this with a serious face. I watch it sarcastically, because I know every stunt they do is so ridiculous and over the top that you just can't help laugh at it and just be entertained. And does this film entertain me? Yeah, in parts it does, but if I have to be critical, it's, it's a bad film. There's no character development, there's no real main threat. The characters split off and each storyline is not that interesting. I would say the best part of the film was probably Jason Momoa's performance as the villain. He just did this kooky thing and it worked. There was one set piece in Rome that I really liked and that was probably the standout. And obviously the last act of the film was extremely funny but stupid at the same time. It's a bad film but in a messed up way I will probably watch it again and really thrive up it. You broke the rules. 
He went to the above world. A man was drowning. I had to save him. This obsession with humans has to stop. Moving on to The Little Mermaid, and Disney have been on this journey of making so many remakes. They've done Maleficent, Cinderella, The Jungle Book, Lion King, Aladdin, and let's be honest, they've not been made to improve the original, they've just been made to make more money. And The Little Mermaid is no exception. You would think a remake improves the original, but no. In The Little Mermaid, every scene, every musical sequence, every performance, it's all inferior to the original. I would recommend just watching the animated from 1989. There is no point in seeing this film, the acting is somehow worse. I have no idea why they cast Javier Bardem as the king, although strangely enough he probably gave the best performance in the film because he actually tried. The visual effects were awful, the design of the fish and Sebastian were just terrifying to look at. The seagull was annoying. Yeah, I can't stress how disappointing this movie was, but somehow it's still not as bad as The Lion King, the live action remake, which isn't really live action, it is animated. But yeah, I should have expected this from Disney. They weren't really gonna go out and do something innovative or creative here. My name is Miles Morales. I'm Brooklyn's one and only Spider-Man. And things are going great. All right, the majority of you won't like this take, but Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse was overall disappointing of me. Don't get me wrong, I like the film, but compared to Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, it just wasn't as good. I was kind of let down by it. Not only for its ending and its length, but just the way the movie flowed. It did move at a fast pace, but it just I didn't feel like it was leading up to anywhere. And when it did end, you just kind of felt underwhelmed. But the real reason I'd struggled with this film is because I didn't really like the actual plot. So basically, Miles Morales is seen as this threat to all the other Spider-Mans and the other Spider-Verses because he inadvertently created this villain called Spot who can go from one universe to the next. And then they spend a lot of time about Miles and his family, which honestly for me, they didn't really need to explore that much. I just thought it went on for too long. But the animation is just gorgeous to look at. Perhaps a little bit too much at times with the color palette. Yeah, the level of animation I'm seeing here is just groundbreaking really. There are a lot of scenes I really enjoyed. The action of course was fantastic. I have no issues with that part of the film, but it was really the ending that didn't go down well for me. But a lot like The Guardians of the Galaxy 3, I would probably give it the same rating. I like the film, but I guess, you know, if I'm being selfish, I just wanted it to be great and it wasn't. But who knows, I guess when the third one releases next year, my opinion of this one will change, hopefully. Another universe. So why do you want to stay and fight to save this one? <laughs> Okay, my most anticipated film of the year, The Flash, of course. Now, I could talk about the history of this film and all the controversy that's been happening around the lead actor, but I'm not gonna do that because we all know what's been going on. I just wanna sit here and judge the movie on its own for what it is. And to be honest, I did not mind it one bit. Sure, there's a lot of stupid scenes in it, but I was quite entertained by it. I like the story of going back in time and trying to fix it and understanding the consequences. The visual effects itself worked okay at times, but then other times it was pretty bad. It's probably some of the worst CGI I've seen all year. I guess what was intended to be a reveal for the film, but because of the controversy, they just revealed it in the trailer, was Michael Keaton as Batman. And for me, he was the best part of the film. He made the story a lot more interesting and a lot more bearable regarding the dynamic between the two versions of The Flash. This is not a good film, it's not a great film, it's just okay, but okay enough to the point where I liked it. It did not do well at the box office as expected, but, but if all that controversy never happened, I do wonder how well this film would have actually done. Would it have made over at least, I don't know, $500 million at the box office? But who knows, maybe in another multiverse it has happened. Okay, now this is a lesser known film, but if you're a film buff, then you know the director and the writer. You're not here. We're not there. The car exploded. Come get the girls, I have to stay here with Woodrow. Asteroid City by Wes Anderson is a film set in this desert town where a junior stargazing competition occurs. The film primarily focuses on one family, a grieving father who hasn't told his children that their mother has just died. Now, Wes Anderson is known for his distinct style of filmmaking, having still framed shots and 
whip pans. He's used it so much that this film has almost become a parody of that. But one thing he did do in this film is go back to what he did in his old films, dealing with dysfunctional families and grief. And I think those aspects of Asteroid City worked really well, but they weren't explored enough. And there was one scene in the middle regarding the stargazing competition that happens that I really liked. But other than that, this film was a massive disappointment and I could only describe it as being extremely irritating because it has this meta plot throughout the film and I just didn't buy it for one second. They're talking all about this, this play within a play, look how smart it is. Wes Anderson, his storytelling is on another level, but it's just not. For me, he hasn't made a good film since The Grand Budapest Hotel, which is probably his best film, I would say. But yeah, Asteroid City had a really good film in there, but then it was just mixed with this all this other annoying stuff that just didn't work for me. So yeah, this is probably one of his most disappointing films that I've experienced. Some people really like it. It's been quite divisive for audiences, some have really gotten bored with it and some haven't, like me. But yeah, I don't plan on watching this film anytime soon. <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on to one of my most favorite movie franchises of all time. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is the fifth of this franchise. This time it's not directed by Steven Spielberg, it's not even written by Lucas, it's directed by James Mangold who did Logan and 310 to Yuma. I wasn't really a big fan of Logan, I thought it was okay, so I wasn't too psyched that he was directing this film. But did it pay off? No. No it did not. It was pretty boring. Indiana Jones just looked like a depressed old man. He looked like the man from Up in this film. I mean it wasn't even Indiana Jones, it was just Harrison Ford in real life. He just didn't want to deal with any of it. The only part I liked was the ending which was, you know, you can say it's ridiculous but I just thought it was the best part of the film. But it was really disappointing because it didn't capture any of the magic, any of the humour that the Indiana Jones films did in the past not Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but the first three. It's such a shame because I love this franchise so much and they just kind of, these last two films, they just kind of ruined it. They've left a bad mark on it. But the only people I really want to blame for this film is Disney. They're the ones who bought the rights to Lucasfilm and have just absolutely buried this franchise to the ground now. It's done now, but I'm not surprised if they're going to reboot it in a few years. Meet the residents of Element City. Air usually has their head in the clouds. The next film is from Disney Pixar called Elemental. Now, a lot like Marvel, Pixar have long been on a downwards projection. It's been almost 10 years since they've made a great movie and Elemental is not a bad film at all. There's a lot of things I really enjoy about it, but there's also parts that just feel quite commonplace and generic. It follows all the typical beats that a Pixar film goes through. I guess Elemental is a romantic comedy. It's a world full of elements like water, fire, earth and wind. And the concept is quite cool, but when you actually watch the film, it's not that unique, it's not that original. And that was what was really disappointing about the film. There was so much you could have done, but what happened in the film is like, why have the elements in the first place? The best part of the film was regarding the fire girl whose relationship with her father was quite emotional. It was a movie more about immigration and struggling to adapt to the new life, the new world that you've moved to. I would have liked if they explored that part of the film more because that was the most interesting. It wasn't the romance. The romance was the most generic thing in the film and it made me not want to watch the film again. Like, it's not bad, but like every other Pixar film in the last few years, it's just been meh. Our lives are the sum of our choices. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1? I don't get Part 1. There's been seven of these movies and now you have a first part. So as confusing as the title was, the movie itself was pretty solid. For me, these type of films, like Fast and Furious, is all about the set pieces. How well can you infuse both the action, the humour, the story? The story itself is quite underwhelming. The villain essentially, and this isn't a spoiler because they pretty much say it from the start, it's AI. And also this guy that they bring back from number two who kind of sucks. So yeah, the villains of this movie sucked, but the set pieces were just amazing. They show in the trailer the scene where he's on the motorcycle going off the cliff. That was the highlight of the film. There was a great sequence in Rome, like in Fast X, but this one was quite comical. It was definitely my one of my favourite set pieces of the film. In terms of what it does for developing characters, like especially the side characters with Simon Pegg and Bing Rames, they kind of just put them aside and introduce these new characters. 
And I didn't like that because they didn't really mix them together in the way that I would have liked. Like Ving Rhames in this movie is just sat in a dark, empty room just giving instructions out and that's pretty much his role. I get he's quite limited to what he can do but it really felt like Tom Cruise was just on his own in this film. But I guess the main thing is that the action was strong and that is what overall made me like the movie. It's not the best Mission Impossible film but it is certainly up there, it's probably top 3 at least. And the fact that it ends on a cliffhanger, there is going to be a part 2 coming out next year hopefully and I'm quite excited to see what they have in store for us. This is a national emergency. Detonator charge. Okay, so Oppenheimer. I've already done a review on the Barbenheimer. I made it quite clear that I liked both films. I don't think Oppenheimer is by any means a masterpiece. In terms of its cinematography, its direction, the score, yeah, the movie is fantastic in that sense. The fact that you can feel the length of this film really does test your patience. There were a lot of scenes that I felt really engaged in and then there were other scenes that I really felt like I was going to fall asleep in. I'm a huge fan of Christopher Nolan and I'm going to see what movie he makes next. Oppenheimer is a good film and there are a lot of great scenes but there are a lot of scenes that do drag as well. It's definitely not his best. It's definitely not his best but if you're a movie lover then this is the film that you have to go and watch in the cinema. Just for the sound, the visuals, there's no other film that provides the experience like a Christopher Nolan film does. But yeah, it could have been better. Hey Barbie, can I come to your house tonight? Sure. Now the next film surprised me because I was expecting it to be a festival of cringe. When I saw the onset photos of Ryan Gosling as Ken, I just thought, yeah, this movie looks ridiculous. But then I saw the movie and I was honestly quite surprised by how refreshing the story was. The comedy for the most part worked. In some parts it didn't, it was quite cringe as I expected. And there are honestly parts of the film that could have gone deeper into the themes of feminism and the social issues of the patriarchy. It could have been a lot more deft, a lot more smarter in what it was trying to present. But I feel like when it mattered, it hit the nail the head. The performances from Ryan Gosling and Margot Robbie are exceptional. The writing from Noah Baumbach and Greta Gerwig, who also directs this film, is also a standout. And it was a smart move to hire Greta Gerwig as the director because as a result of this the movie has done extremely well. It's made over a billion dollars at the box office and is currently the second highest grossing film of the year. So yeah, like I said in the review, I was surprised by this film, but really I shouldn't have been, because when you look at the cast and the director, I should have expected it to have been good. All right, it's only fitting that we wrap this summer off with a superhero film. Excuse me, Mr. Reyes. You finished scraping the gum off that lounger or what? Oh. Superhero films have dominated this industry for the last 10, 15 years. They've made so many now, we're going into the obscure world of finding these superheroes that no one's ever heard of. You know, 10 years ago they made Ant-Man, no one heard of that before. But now everyone knows him. They've made three movies already and they've made over a billion dollars. So Blue Beetle is by DC and DC obviously have been in the shadow of Marvel for the past few years. They've been trying to replicate their humour, their tone, and it does work at times. It worked in Shazam, a film that I wasn't a big fan of, and to be honest, I wasn't a big fan of Blue Beetle. It was probably the most generic, commonplace story for a superhero film that you could ask for. The parts that I liked were the lead actor's performance. I'm not going to say his name because I'll butcher it, so I'm just going to call him Miguel from Cobra Kai. He had a lot of charm and was very likeable for the film. I thought George Lopez as his uncle was also a standout. The family dynamic was the heart of the film, and I wish they'd explored this more. I wish they'd talked more about Jamie's family and his struggles of immigrating from Mexico to the United States. But then that all just got pushed to the side by these villains that just didn't work at all. I didn't feel any threat from them, they weren't interesting at all. They were all just very disposable characters. You know, DC is supposed to have interesting villains. The Joker is one of the best villains in comic book history. And then here we have Susan Sarandon. I, I don't understand how we got to here. So the first half of Blue Beetle is fine, but then when it goes into the second half, that's when I really started to check out. And I just got so bored and that pretty much just reflected my general opinion of the films that we saw this summer, it was overall quite disappointing. If I had to rank them, you know, the worst films that I saw this year were definitely Fast X and The Little Mermaid and Blue Beetle. But I do have intentions of watching Fast X again because I'm a psychopath. The best films I saw were definitely Barbie and Oppenheimer. I think Barbie was surprisingly my favourite film of this summer. But yeah, that's my overall take of the summer movies 2023. Which films did you see? Which ones did you like? Which ones did you hate? Let me know in the comments what your favourite film was. Let me know how how bad all my opinions are on these movies. Guys, if you could like and subscribe, that would help my channel a lot. I really appreciate that so I can make more videos like this and hopefully I can see you again next time. Bye.